welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about costume. I'm Jenna Mathiason, an objects conservator based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Ramsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservator based in Cambridgeshire. Welcome to the show, everyone. Right, let's do some quick news first. Icon has started a new modern materials network as a specialist. I'm so group. excited about that one. I know, right? That's amazing. And the other thing I was going to say is that Museums Association have a kind of discussion paper out called Collections 2030. And that's all about where collections are going in the future. And they're looking for people to respond to that paper. And you have until November 23rd to respond. And we'll pop a link to their survey that they've got out. So because they're really keen on getting people's thoughts uh, on where collections are going and how that's, you know, changing and what we where we want to go with collections. So I think that will be really valuable for conservatives to get in on, especially if your organization is going to respond. That sounds brilliant isn't it yeah okay so we're talking about costume today guys and specifically displaying it and mounting it so what are our experiences around the table of that sort of thing like uh, christina what have you done i am obviously primarily an objects conservator so i've only really done costume when it's things that are counted as objects if that makes sense yeah (laughs) rather than primarily dress so i'm currently working um, a collection of stuff from Pacific countries. Ooh. And there's quite a few things there that I guess count as costumes, sort of things that would be used in dance oh, um, beautiful. and rituals and that sort of thing. Oh, interesting. And, um, uh, I've also just finished installing an exhibition at the Royal Academy called Oceania, a massive exhibition of really, really cool stuff. So I'm actually hoping to go and get to see that properly now it's installed. But among other things, our museum supplied a suit of armour from Kiribati that that's made of woven plaited coconut fibre, for example. And I would say things like that are definitely costume yeah. rather than objects in the traditional object sense. So, yeah, I've been thinking about that kind of thing a bit really recently. I've also done a bit recently for the galleries, and again, it's Pacific stuff rather than costume. I suppose when I say talk about costume, I, the first thing that comes to mind tends to be like big 18th century silk yeah. dresses or whatever. <laughs> I was going to say costume can be a really broad uh, concept though. So, you know, it can be whatever yeah. we want it to be. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if you're including things like hats and shoes yeah. and so on. Yeah, and technically I've, costume. Yeah, I've had yeah. experience of a few objects like that as well. In the last year, I've had my first experience really of getting to play with foss shape. Oh, I Ooh. love foss shape. And yeah, we're going to be talking about oh that Oh my God, lot. that was amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you lo- uh, you I lucky love I've never been near Foss Sheep. I only hear about it. It's too expensive. <laughs> uh, I tried. <laughs> there was a training course oh. at the VNA uh, earlier this year, and I tried to get onto it, but it was already full up. And oh. I just decided to get to go on that. But I'm really hoping they'll run it again, and I get to go on that because that looked really cool. Mm. And so I've used that to make supports for a bodice made out of bark cloth, for example. Mm-hmm. And, oh, nice. Um, I'm going to be using it again because I'm working on a loan that's going to Hong Kong soon. And one of the things is a large women's winter coat from Northern China. Mm. Amazing. And it's huge, this thing. Far too big to go on a mannequin. And it's going to need some sorts of internal supports as well to Ooh. kind of bulk it out and pad it out a bit more. Wow. And one of the things we're thinking of doing is using foss shape to make custom shaped oh. supports. And again, make it so that it can travel on a mount that supports it, which is also its display mount. And things like foss shape are great for that. Amazing. So I've, I've not done much in the way of costume mounting, but I have been... Um, I've actually trained at the V&A for it for a week. That's so cool. It is really cool. So I got to do, it was a really gorgeous 1920s wedding dress um, mm. with like really oh, wow. weird cellulose nitrate pannier th- net things on the sides. Um, really, really narrow as well. <laughs> like almost the kind of she was sewn into it type type <laughs> thing. So I used just the, the normal body form adaptation method, but got to play with Foss shape. Um, just for little sleeve cap bits to go onto it. So I've not had much of a chance to play with Foss Shape, but in the respect that I have, I've kind of been delighted and amazed by it. Um, yeah. But I absolutely love costume. So I find I find it very fascinating generally. Um, on my end, so because we have a really varied collection, we do have costume. Yeah, so I've I've gotten to work with costume a little bit and 
mostly it's been either uniforms because <laughs> we have a military collection in which case it does not fit on any modern male mannequin because people were much tinier mm. um which is the bane of my existence just trying to make <laughs> female mannequins look like males <laughs> um or it's you know things like victorian morning dresses mm -hmm. and stuff like that right where it's very much mm -hmm. the social history angle of it mm -hmm. um that that we're putting on display for certain things and that sort of thing but yeah it's it's been really fun it is challenging and i've done a, a little bit of adapting mannequins you know very much whittling things down or padding them and in yeah. various ways trying to savagely make them the right shape <laughs> for the object for as little money as possible so that's kind of where i'm at with this where i'm like oh give me a give me a terrible mannequin and a hacksaw and I'll make it work <laughs> <laughs> that's probably going to be the most sort of commonly relevant type of experience isn't it that possibly it's, you're, you're probably not going to have like a beautifully made mannequin that you can pad up mm. in a lovely sort of or a pipe dream type yeah. <laughs> lab with all of the foam and time and no, or, a, or a department of technicians on hand going of course we'll make this beautiful yeah, for you exactly, yeah. <laughs> you, you just reminded me that in a previous museum actually i had loads to do with costume because we had a large collection relating to polar exploration oh, yeah, of course. Cool. and in fact i spent like a whole year rehousing all of the coats hats gloves oh, <laughs> i love how you vests. can just forget this christine you've got the type of experience <laughs> where you're just like oh shit yeah I, I just remembered that I have this exact experience this is what we're going to be like I in 10 years I think of it as a costume I mean this is this is kind of my problem rather than yours that I I didn't think of it as costume and there's obviously something in my head that says yeah costume has to be historic it has to be frilly um, dresses yeah. I, I, this is yeah absolutely this is totally my problem <laughs> but um yeah and we had to do an exhibition and we didn't really have any suitable mannequins it was it was supposed to show somebody in your typical modern polar gear yeah. so a very heavy padded coat and trousers yeah and that's boots, goggles tons. And that kind of thing so we borrowed a mannequin from another museum and it was covered in black velvet or black that kind of yeah. velveteen stuff lovely <laughs> so it was really quite quite creepy and i've just remembered that a colleague and i had to carry this thing down the street <laughs> like doing double takes calling at us out of cars that kind of thing it was, it was quite I, I, I would like to match that story with i have carried a creepy gray foam child mannequin oh, no. in the streets uh, oh. and i stopped to talk to one of my neighbors on the way out because i i had to had to drop it off in my house so i had to carry it to work uh, and i stopped to talk to my neighbor <laughs> because they have dogs and i was like oh hello and she was very traumatized by the entire experience <laughs> of me standing there holding a stiff gray child <laughs> mannequins are just creepy aren't mannequins they mannequins are quite creepy with them. and also mannequins they come in but they really come in a real variety of shapes and forms and like weirdness because we we've, we've got like a a section of our store that's full of things that i find largely unusable mm -hmm. so they're very specific mannequins like quite broad-shouldered men and they're covered in something terry cloth like and uh. i'm like what is this <laughs> that, this is not conservation grade and then you've got like this kind of standard foam ones mm -hmm. that are just like the torso with the weird jersey like material on mm -hmm. top and then you've mm -hmm. got the full form creepy gray mannequins and it's very difficult to make them fit any clothes because they're just too tall just put a bend in the legs <laughs> yeah i have actually oh, yeah. <laughs> should we talk about fashion because i feel like yeah. i feel as though this is probably one of those things that if you work in a museum where you got this mannequin and that's all there is and you just gotta make do it's sort of irrelevant but it does really affect how we how we think about mannequins that are available sort of in the back of a store because there were there was once a display of you know etc cetera, etc cetera, and how we see the ones at the vna for example because i imagine there's a very probably a universe well countrywide i won't say universal national perception of whatever the vna is doing is what everyone else should be doing. Because yeah, that's Visually, the bomb. Because that's the bomb. And everything else is, you know, oh, well, there's a head on this, but we'll try not to make it too creepy. <laughs> and I imagine that, obviously, if there's hats, use ones with heads. Also, interestingly, we don't always go for that. Like, if it's like... Mm, so I think it's a thing of, A, how tall the case is, because sometimes that's a limiting <laughs> yeah, factor. But also... <laughs> 
But also, I know that we favor putting military uniform, for example, on a headless one that just has that weird nub at the, at yes, the top. Yes, I like and the nub. And then we hang the cap on the nub, yes. but padded, so it's yeah. not yeah, yeah. damaging. Like so, so it doesn't have a proper head. Because uh-huh. actually, I don't think that style of mannequin has any heads in our collection. They're the more kind of what I think of as tailor mm-hmm. ones with the, like the nice uh, curvy stand that goes oh, down. Oh, the kind wooden, of a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that kind of, it's quite stylish uh-huh. in a case. Yeah. But doesn't come with a head. That's that's how we do that. But yeah, if it has a hat, I think it's, it would be nice for it to have a head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really hard when you're displaying part of a costume as well. Mm. So, like, do you just have the bottom half of a mannequin to show some trousers, for example? Or trousers you do, are it is difficult. Going to look yeah, so weird. trousers and skirts yeah. are probably the worst because what happens if you don't have a top half? That looks really weird. As well, you can get away with like the top half without a bottom half to a greater yeah. extent. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, uh, this. What would you do if you only had. I'd not thought of that. If you only had the trousers in a suit, would you make like a sort of shirt? I feel like with a lot of other types of object mounting mm. and you were missing a bit of the object, you would make the vague resemblance of the rest of the object to fill in the gaps. But you wouldn't necessarily make like a calico shirt, for example, to go with trousers. So it yeah, didn't exactly. just look like a, t- a top lip. But why? why would I you- think that would be really really misleading it would be it would be because obviously fabric but it's a it's an interesting difference in attitude isn't it yeah it is rather i mean i think one one thing i've seen is museums that then pin the trousers or at least just mount them flat so you can see them and then they don't have that kind of weird disembodied look but then the downside of that is obviously you're missing the 3d aspect of it and clothes are obviously meant to be worn Uh and they only really make sense when they're being worn so i don't know what i was going to say is that um i've mentioned that i'd previously had to mount a bark cloth bodice yeah oh yeah um for display in our gallery a few months ago and the bodice is actually made by a contemporary fashion designer. So it's part of this whole, um, they have a thing called Pacific Fashion Week, where contemporary designers from Pacific areas create clothing, but they often reference traditional materials and designs and so on. So uh-huh. this was a, I think it was meant to be a wedding dress. It was a bodice and it had a skirt, but we didn't have a skirt, I don't think. And it was strapless with a shell pendant in the middle of the chest and then a sort of halter neck tie to hold it up. And I made, uh, we didn't have any mannequins or torsos that would fit it. So I made a support out of foss shape to sit inside oh, it. And lovely. That all looked fine. But then what do you do with the halter neck if you don't have a neck? Oh, yeah. So do you do you kind of continue your foss shape form up without any arms and just make like shoulders and a neck so you've got something to tie this cord round? But then that looks really weird, especially if it doesn't have any arms. And anyway, the, sh- the, <laughs> the case was really, really tight for space. So, you know, we didn't really have room to start expanding just so things didn't look weird. And in the end, what we did was just tuck the tie down. Unfortunately, keep the shell there and pin that, but tuck the halter neck tie down because we had nothing to tie it around. Oh, that and is yeah. tricky. There was yeah. no neck. No, so. That's tricky. I've so seen, in I've the seen end, people... it was just literally an internal support for this mm, thing. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've seen people do like, you know, when someone's been displaying something like a lace collar with the nice little frilly bit at the front, but they don't have an, it doesn't sit on mm. anything. Yeah. Then I've seen people make like a, a foss shape kind of just backdrop. Like, so it's mm-hmm. like a little neck and then just like a bit of what would be the chest area. So it just sits on something. Yeah. But then it has no context other than that. It's not like it has shoulders uh-huh. or anything. It's just there to show off that little bit and give support for but the then object. That's quite a that's quite a common way of displaying, for example, like lace pieces, isn't it? No, that, that's true. Yeah. That they, yeah. It's common for them to be just a sort of flat mounted basically. Yeah. So maybe people are more used to understanding yeah, the concept maybe. of that than just armbands or something. If you were, to. yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's tricky. I isn't? have occasionally seen mounts made out of perspex. Yeah, so you've got the suggestion of the shape of the body. Yeah, and the objects kind of mounted in relations on the perspex, particularly where there's missing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That does get hugely expensive, though. Well, the, and I feel like all of my examples of this episode are VNA, and I've. I've apologize to everyone who's listening going oh, all right fine yeah the vna is good at it all right i get it <laughs> yeah i know none of us can be the vna but i um 
last week actually was amazingly lucky to go to the Frida Kahlo exhibition at the V&A, making herself up. Mm. Uh, I love it so much. There was a section in the middle where they were displaying her casts and really interestingly her corsetry type things because she was if you don't know the history of her she was very badly injured when she was young and then the casts and corsets sort of kept her upright basically and in particular one example which is basically just a column at the front and a column at the back and then straps and these things were so beautifully mounted with perspex you you barely noticed the perspex was there it was mm-hmm. extremely clever and i was looking at this thinking wow how would anyone else mount this <laughs> Because, of course, the V&A can have a suspended perspex cage that you wrap something around beautifully and safely and, you know, no one even thinks that there is a mount there, which is obviously the point. Uh, it's something nice to aspire to, but sometimes yeah. you do need something a bit more. Now, it's, it's tricky and there are a lot of, you know, interesting challenges like that. And particularly, oh God, altering mannequins for shape are like the least fun thing ever sometimes. And you should give us the lowdown of that. Well, I mean, if you get those cheap mannequins that are all foam inside, mm, mm-hmm. by which I mean they're horrible styrofoam, that's oh, what I'm yeah. thinking of, uh, then you can carve that quite nicely, especially mm-hmm. if you have a hot knife. You can mm-hmm. carve that down. And then usually whatever fabric goes on top is stretchy enough that you can still reuse that because you know how you usually yes. have to take off a sock oh, and then yeah. it's kind of the yeah. bare styrofoam. Uh-huh. And then you can just kind of go to town on that with a hot knife if you needed to have mm-hmm. more more waste or less boob mm-hmm. or anything like that, right? And then you can just slip that sock over again and maybe tuck it in with some yeah. pins to make it a little bit uh-huh. tighter. And then that's still, you know, a kind of safe, nice thing for the yeah. for the clothes to sit on. What would you say the time? Because obviously if it's nasty styrofoam, you don't want it to be permanent display. No, quite. Time. No, I would what only use... What kind of I would length use for, of time would you think? I don't use for temporary things, you know, yeah. things that are less than a year. Less than a year, yeah. yeah. I'd be the same, I think. Yeah. I Which know. is annoying because it limits you entirely and then you've got to explain to, I suppose the money holders <laughs> yes it's okay for this but it's not okay for this why isn't it okay for this because <sighs> <Well, laughs> of these reasons <laughs> oh well, yeah you get into that territory whenever you alter a mannequin for anything though because ultimately you're making a very drastic change of a mannequin depending on how you do it but unless you're padding and it's not permanent mm-hmm. then if you're carving away at something or you have to alter the proportions of a mannequin you're doing that on a permanent scale yeah for the mannequin yeah. so ultimately you might have doomed that mannequin to only work for one costume in your entire collection and that can be a hard sell true yeah. um, that can be a very hard sell sometimes you know when it's like well you really want this to go on display so that means you have to sacrifice this mannequin to basically be its mannequin mm-hmm. forever yeah. Yeah. That can be hard depending on what kind of budget, budgetary restrictions you have and stuff like that. And also about how much time you have, because often, you know, these sorts of things are like, oh my God, I found this amazing thing. I want it mounted now because the exhibition opens on Friday. Good luck. <laughs> it's Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please help me. <laughs> uh, which case, you know, uh, you don't have that much time to play with. No. You? It's uh, all sorts of levels possible. But yeah, if you get creative with some hot knives or some like hacksaws, then you can do wonders with various things. But it is about object safety, isn't it? Because it it's, is. It's, when I was learning about, obviously, you, you you think about these things theoretically when you're when you're thinking about the concept of costume mounting, for example. But when I was actually looking at an extremely heavy sort of silvered gown with heavy dangly bits off the sides of it, the safety of the object was so kind of obvious to me in the necessity of where where the, the big bits are. Where is it being oh, yeah, supported? Yeah. Where is it not being supported? Where can it hang freely? And that is such a, it's sort of a, a gradient, isn't it, of how safe can you make this object and where will it look good? Because some costume, obviously, the point of the costume is that it's under a great deal of pressure and strain and that's what the object is supposed to look yeah. like. Mm for example, any corsetry ever. But then that's actually, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that with an object. You can't sort of, you can't lace in a corset to the same degree as you would with a with a body inside it. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. So we've touched on this earlier with you, Christina, but we've been talking a lot about, so far, about fashion. Stereotypical costume, like the big dress with the big skirt or a suit. Posh stuff. Posh stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. But... But then you go into, say, your ethnographic museums and there's so mm-hmm. many different types of objects that don't mm-hmm. go on the standard mannequin or that are 
that obscure the standard mannequin to such a degree as you're talking about with the coat that there's no point in having a mannequin inside it because you've just got like hands poking out and that's it I would add archaeological material to that as well. So, of course, uh, yeah, te- yeah, that's a good point. Most archaeological textiles aren't don't survive, but there are some that are preserved. For example, ancient Egyptian clothing, mm-hmm. of which there are several examples, which is preserved obviously because the climate is very hot and dry. Mm-hmm. Or at the other end of the spectrum, in Denmark, I've seen um, things like cloaks and so on that have been preserved in peat bogs. Of course, cool. Um, and are on display there as well. And so that's clothing that is often very fragmentary. So we might just have a tiny bit of the border of a cloak, for example, from a Danish museum, or that is very, very fragile, as a lot of these things are. So obviously, you're not going to be putting that on a mannequin. You've got to think about different yeah. methods mm. of display for that kind of stuff as well. And I would say that the same is often true of ethnographic material as well. I feel like you see that sort of thing often displayed in a kind of a flat way. So sometimes even Mm -hmm. pressure mounted, you know, like framed or otherwise very flat. And it loses something in its, you know, because that's That's never how you... (laughs) Yeah, but you never, you never, that's not how it would have been worn or seen. And I feel like that sort of display is very good if you have something alongside it, for example, that maybe an illustration that shows how it would have been worn something that gives it context something that Mm -hmm. says yeah maybe this hem is from something that would have looked a bit like this uh you know anything like that relies on related material yeah it does it does to a great degree so um the oceania exhibition at the royal academy (laughs) um two of the items we took were cloaks that were far too large and too fragile to go on mannequins Mm. and so were laid flat in cases one of them was a hawaiian feathered cloak Mm -hmm. so a cloak covered in red and yellow feathers is absolutely stunning Um, oh i've seen very heavy very fragile (laughs) so that went on a board that was Mm -hmm. uh, a covered board that was custom made just for that cloak and went into the case on a slight slope Mm -hmm. so that you could see it more easily but it's on a board and the the cloak itself um is a kind of wedge shape if that makes sense mm-hmm. in the the bottom hem is wider than the top so it's oh, so you yeah. opened so it out i think mm-hmm. you, looking at it you can kind of yeah exactly you could kind of see how it would have worked mm-hmm. the other thing was an object that i did which was a cloak from a maori cloak from new zealand made of woven flax oh i'm familiar with yeah I, they're um, lovely aren't yeah. they yeah so it's a couple of hundred years old at least more i think and very very fragile again no chance that that's going on a mannequin so again that was displayed flat but we did partly out of necessity because of the case size (laughs) but also partly for interpretation we did actually make padded rolls to sit inside the ends and curve the ends round a bit and so on so it had a bit of kind of movement yeah while it was on display it had some a couple of folds in it that was supported underneath with um, sausages made out of calico basically stuffed with polyester wadding that again was on a raised board and so to keep it in place we used magnets which is magnet use oh man i love magnet kind of use stuff. so i painted 200 bloody magnets <laughs> <in this exhibition. laughs> Oh, I feel like there's a growing number of conservators who will be nodding along with like, oh yeah, yeah, I've pay- I've spent a lot of can time. Can I painting. talk about magnets for five minutes? <laughs> yes, you can. Yes. So uh, okay, so we also had four bark cloths that went on the wall, including one that was four meters long. Oh my god! <laughs> which were also held up with magnets. Um, so that was an interesting process installing those. So I I was interested. Quite a few of the other lenders to this exhibition were also using magnets, and I talked to a few people, and they all had different different methods of toning in the magnets so that they blended in a bit better how did you do it on. so we we were using those little rare earth magnets yeah um, previously my museum has painted them with uh-huh. acrylic paints and you can get quite a nice even finish with that but it takes quite a long time it takes a lot of patience if you put the paint on too thick it just peels off again often you need to kind of scuff up the surface to provide a key 
for the paint to stick to it because obviously they're just smooth metal surfaces so you you need to kind of take a bit of rough sandpaper to it or something like that so the paint actually sticks the advantage of that obviously is that it's very easy to match the color because you're basically just mixing paint and so you can get a very close match and if you're careful about how you apply the paint you can get quite a nice matte finish and then we back them with a little circle of melanex so that the Mm -hmm. magnet isn't in direct contact with the object there's there's a little barrier layer of melanex that's Mm -hmm. the same uh, same size and shape as the magnet we tend to use round magnets that are 20 millimeters in diameter but i have seen people using bar shaped ones or square ones or whatever i've even seen people using more kind of 3d ones like pyramid shapes and so on but i i think those can often look a bit weird (laughs) because they they then look more like objects Mm-hmm. Or yeah. like, of the like object. part of the yeah. object yeah yeah whereas at least the flat discs from a distance especially if the lighting is quite low as you'd hope it would be mm-hmm. that they often are very very unobtrusive however for this exhibition i didn't paint them and i toned japanese tissue paper that's what we did yeah that's what we did for our last exhibition it's a really good method did that work better yeah and it looks really good on the bark cloth because Mm. the texture is quite sympathetic to the bark cloth it's very quick obviously to paint a whole sheet of japanese tissue with we used dilute i use dilute acrylic paint Mm -hmm. and so you just paint it as you would normally tone your japanese tissue leave it to dry and then the only problem is because the paper is is not opaque unless you use really thick paper. But if you use really thick paper, it's hard to wrap the magnet nicely. So um, what I tended to do was put a sort of very rough base colour on the magnets and then put the paper on top of that. And that's also quite helpful because you get the base colour showing through very slightly in the little gaps in the weave of the paper. Mm. And then that means it kind of breaks up the colour a bit as well. So it's not just a flat, solid colour. I spoke to another guy there uh, from another museum. They cover their magnets with masking tape which is obviously even quicker and i would never have thought of that and i've got you know the masking tape slightly textured so that's an interesting one i haven't tried that myself but that's an interesting i hate adhesive tape um, so much i probably wouldn't i'd probably just (laughs) fling the masking tape out of the room like no well again i would again i would want my barrier layer of melanex in there i think i would feel really unhappy about putting the masking tape directly next to the magnet i when i was covering them with japanese tissue i stuck the tissue down with clues lg i basically cut circles that were a bit bigger than the magnet circle Uh stuck the top side stuck it to the top of the magnet and let that dry for a bit because you don't want it kind of squirming around (laughs) while you're trying to wrap it and then you can wrap ease the sides around and the other nice thing about paper is it's slightly it's uh, flexible pliable stretchy you can kind of ease it around Mm. so it becomes a sort of uh, almost a kind of papier mache type type process yeah finally (laughs) um i saw some costume in fact that was mounted with magnets but the magnets had just been put in calico bags that were painted oh so round magnets in a square calico bag it's really quick to sew the calico bag and you then pop the magnet inside sew it shut and paint it so it tones in a bit more and then just plop it on your object that magnets it's amazing. were it's all amazing. over the place <laughs> in this exhibition it's amazing how um, versatile magnets can be for yeah even just attaching different bits of a costume and holding up yeah. bits that you know otherwise you would stitch on or hook on and the hooks are too fragile or whatever so it's really cool i really i'm a fan of magnets actually I've, I'm, I'm seeing them used in more and more versatile ways yeah that's very cool uh, i really like tea bars as well for s- displaying costume because you've got the Sorry, you were going to say something. No, not at all. I'm looking at you because I was trying to figure out what the T-bar was and then I realised, oh yeah, it's a T-shaped thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duh. (laughs) (laughs) So there's a load of, there's a, I think, well, all over the world they've used the straight shoulder arm with a block body method, haven't they? Not just kimonos, not just whatever. The shape of it always reminds me of the Rio statue of Jesus. Yeah. You know, because he's very... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I had not. Because even it's cross shaped. They're really, really easy to mount. And I like mm. the elegance of. So I've seen uh, the Whitworth has mounted um, a couple of those, that form of costume on just a pole suspended with fishing line from the roof of the case. And it's, there's no, um, there's no, it's not a heavy object. So it's, you know, it's fine. There's no central support bar. It's just as though it was 
a textile folded over a pole hanging from the um, roof of the case. Mm. And it's just such an elegant mm. way of doing it because you just have the object. Minimalistic. Minimalistic indeed, yeah. Mm. But then I quite like those ones with heads because it's it's kind of so stylized. stylized. It's almost art deco in the way that they do it. Mm. But then you are in... in then you are kind of enforcing a particular kind of modernist style that wouldn't necessarily align with the object yeah, that you're mounting. That's, that's the thing about mannequins that's, and stuff. That's actually something that occurred to me when we were talking about mannequins. And do you think you are unconsciously influenced by the mannequin itself and like how nice or otherwise how cheap how classy it's perceived to be? Do you think that affects your perception as the costumer as well? Because it does kind of oh, probably. become part I of the think, costume yes. the mountain. I think, and if yes. something's on one of these really terrible, <laughs> scary <laughs> mannequins, for example, like the grey ones you were talking about, Jenny. Oh, they're terrible. Um, I, I think it does, it does really do a disservice to the costume as well. And I think it changes how you view that. Or mm. if the mannequins are really kind of 1980s style and they've got like ridiculous hairstyles, for example. I think that's, that's quite distracting. Yeah. I've yeah, just remembered that-, that my dad used to have a factory that man- manufactured mannequins for shops. Really? Um, and <laughs> what? My to do the makeup for them. Oh, my God. The makeup? This is when I was quite small. Yes. Oh, my God. And uh, very 1980s, like loads of coloured eyeshadow and so on in a terribly <laughs> glamorous way. And um, as kids, we always used to get the wigs to play with. <laughs> Oh my God, wait, and if I can find some photos, I will tweet them. That's amazing, photos, please. I hope you find some. 1980s too. mannequins, I will. I have... What about ethnicity? Yeah, but then do... Because I think you're getting into... Do mannequins have ethnicity on the basis that they tend to just be a weird colour or a neutral colour? Well, yeah, but I mean, if you've got your kind of beige skin colour, that I think is very... No, I, no, I suppose you're right, yeah. That's right. The, yeah, that's the problem with the calico covered as well, yeah. isn't it? Because it's it's just calico, but it ain't just calico because it's very much that's good sort point. of... It's I guess not I was thinking of my grey ones. Where uh, that, I hope nobody looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's the thing as well, isn't it? Well, actually, at the, at the the my place of work, um, we had a... The exhibition that's on currently um, is displaying a modern... Jump black jumpsuit from a protest group and uh, the majority of the women who um, head up the that protest group are uh, women of colour and the only mannequin we had was just a white mannequin. It wasn't s- sort of white skin tone mannequin, it was just... But it just, was white. It was just bright white. Yeah. Um, so it was... It was a, there was a moment where we had to just take a photograph of it on the mannequin say... Is this all right? Is this offensive in any way? You know, oh, I realised it. Checked. Well, it was just one of these. You know, you don't want to put it up and put it on display and go, "Hey, look at the opening," and then everyone them being to say, very "Well, grubby. that's offensive." Yeah, yeah. Mm. and they obviously they said that was fine, so we ran with it. But when you're working with community groups and the culture, the owning cultures, that must be another layer of things to consider. With what does the mannequin look like? Is it in? Is there any sort of kind of racial stereotyping alongside it with that they might point. might consider and it's a wouldn't. good point because we um, recently had to buy some child size mannequins because we uh-huh. found that we only had the creepy gray one and it just didn't <laughs> yeah. really work right and because we're supposed to be a child-friendly museum and all that stuff we're gonna be displaying a lot of like kid-sized stuff so mm-hmm. we decided okay we're gonna need some uh, child size mannequins and having gone and looked at various mannequin suppliers i found that in, they don't come in colors they just come in like white or off-white it's not like you can choose at least Mm. nothing i looked at gave you the option of going for something that was like let's say a warmer skin color or like even anything that was considered skin color like it was all like this is your plain white this is your plain magnolia mannequin is this a whitewash thing do you think do you think Um, it's us being awful in this country or is it just that's the color they come in because you you how often in shops have you seen mannequins that aren't just white? Often, I've seen bright orange ones. I, I guess <laughs> I was going to say. I think of the glossy, what, the glossy black ones now. You know, yeah, yeah no, they're no, very no. popular. I meant ones with realistic skin tones that aren't. Oh, I see. No, never. <laughs> no, pretty much never. So it's possible they're just not made. 
or at least not commonly available. Or if they are available, they are so expensive that nobody can afford them. Yeah. Padding up a plastic mannequin is an interesting process, actually. Oh, God. Um, that I've seen in a couple of cases now, not just the VNA, I promise. Though they did have a, an exhibition with like bikinis, which I was really interested in. How do you even? Oh, yeah. It's basically just making little undies, isn't it? Mm. It's really cute. Make little padded undies. And also them. little chicken fillets. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a, that's a strange one. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> My other example is going actually back to head types on uh, and and specific mannequin forms. And I'm sorry, yes, again, I am using a VNA example, but this one is so wonderful. Again, the Frida Kahlo exhibition. Oh, yeah, because they uh, made the heads. They didn't they? they made mm. with the privilege of the VNA. <laughs> 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 they made specific, and I think they do for every time. Make spe- specific mannequins for the specific show that there was. I spoke to the mounter Rachel, um, who was the the, the project mounter, the exhibition mounter, in so December a few seven months before the opening of the exhibition and she was in the process of designing the mannequins and she had worked out the dimensions of Frida Kahlo as the woman by her clothing shit her clothing sizes Mm -hmm. which is amazing her height waist size etc she had identified I think it was three arm and hand positions Mm -hmm. that were kind of iconically her and gone through the process or she was uh, I think at the time of speaking to her mostly the way through the process of designing these mannequins that were Frida Kahlo and when I was speaking to her she was going through the process of designing the head and it was all about how much do you put in the way of facial features what do you do with the hair you know it has to be iconically Frida Kahlo but but subtle but subtle Mm. and not sort of you know there are eyelashes kind of thing um, and what they achieved just a pair of eyebrows <laughs> yeah <laughs> and what they achieved was actually really kind of subtle and a, a delicate nod to her whilst also conforming to what people would want to see the expectation of what they actually want to see which is mm. they want to go and they they want to see Frida Kahlo's clothing on Frida Kahlo and yeah. that was really nice but again so resource heavy you can't believe it Obviously, Rachel did a fantastic job. Um, everyone's all very jealous of what she managed to achieve. I feel like, right, so obviously fashion in museum exhibitions has become a huge thing, right? Uh, it's such a big trend now. We've been seeing it for years. And I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon, I think. Displaying costume. People love see costume. Yeah, it, it's going to keep being big, like really big. And I mean, obviously the V&A and like places like the Met and all that stuff, they do really, you know, really top grade stuff. I'm also thinking what kind of exhibitions we're seeing. I feel like it's like iconic people like Frida mm-hmm. Kahlo. Yeah, yeah. Um, David Bowie. Yeah. Groups of people like like royal family, that sort mm-hmm. of thing, right? And also fashion houses have been doing their own things so that represent the work of a designer for a fashion uh-huh. house through the ages like that sort of thing other than that i see weddings like every, everyone everyone <laughs> yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. freaking loves seeing wedding dresses yeah. like a room full of wedding dresses makes people throw money at you apparently i don't get oh, this is a personal gripe i don't <laughs> get that because i feel like in a way wedding dresses are um, very much changed by the style of their time, mm. but they don't represent the, the the style. They don't represent what people were wearing at all. They just represent what people were wearing on one day. Yeah, I, I think this is probably just like a really hyped up wedding culture thing. Oh, yeah. Because I'm I'm being very skeptical of this because I don't really think wedding dresses are all that special. I've worked on wedding dresses and they are fine, but they are <laughs> not more interesting to me than another Work dress wear. in front of me. Yeah, exactly. All costume is interesting and I guess I'm possibly just a bit, yeah, yeah, it's fine uh, about the entire thing, right? Uh, but then I'm not one of these princess type people either who's like really, oh, white wedding dresses. Like that's never been my thing. But I recognise that it's something that other people really love and that's why they're so hugely popular, I think. Can I just add that the v has a video on their website about making the Frida Kahlo mannequins? Oh, do they? Great. Oh, brilliant. Well, in that okay, case, we'll great. pop that in the show notes. But yeah, so those are the kinds of exhibitions that I see. And mm-hmm. But I kind of want museums out there to do more. If you're going to show off fashion and costume, I would love for you to do exhibitions that are like 
this is what people in the area wore for That's the 1950s. I or I just, I want to see more everyday things. Mm-hmm. I love that I can go and see Frida Kahlo stuff. That's amazing. Obviously, that's amazing. You can't, it's sold out. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, well <laughs> in theory, I could have. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I love that those things are available and they should very much still be a thing. But I also think that we there's so much beauty. Having just gone through a hundred white nightgowns, and I know that every museum with a social history collection has a billion nightgowns <laughs> but having actually gone through them and seeing the different levels of embroidery Gorgeous. the different decorations how people have very much personalized these and these are hand sewn things this is before machine stitching and all that right having seen some of the effort and beauty put into an everyday object like that mm-hmm. i just think there are endless exhibitions in there just highlighting how amazing it is that humans have made costumes costume like this people's workwear i love i want to see workwear. workwear yeah love it yeah so my museum has a great collection of workwear that i have never i've never even opened the boxes of mm. yeah i mean i've only been there for a year and there's all sorts of other things i've got to do first <laughs> uh, but um <laughs> we've also got a brilliant collection of political t-shirts oh that's uh, which cool. i have seen a number of mm. obviously because we have accession some in the time that i've been there but there's there's you know the interest of how people dress their bodies and how they present themselves yeah um whether that's how people present themselves personally or how let's face it companies and employers want to dress their employees yeah it's really interesting it's really really interesting uh, i really look forward to seeing what people do that's not all like super duper this is a celebrity and you know oh my god uh, this is an iconic person because well, everyday people are also very cool that's there's a couple of interesting things going on here though isn't there because there's both what the audience wants we are designing exhibitions now to get people in and to make money sometimes or encourage funders and raise visitor numbers whatever but there's also in terms of what we actually do when we mount costume it's about what the costume is for Mm. and what is it supposed to is it about the shape of the body for example is it supposed to accentuate a specific iconic shape like with well quite a lot of costume actually (laughs) but i was going to use the example of victorian female costume Mm -hmm. is it about the fabric the weave of the fabric so kimono or similar types of essentially their case studies for the art of the fabric aren't they in a way or the safety of the person are they for displaying an identity or are they for yeah. keeping someone safe are they you know like lab coats for example many different themes to explore there really very many anyway i thought we might end on uh, some resources uh, if we've Ooh. got any um at all so <laughs> Because I'm a povo and I can't go to paid training. (laughs) Um, I find webinars very, very helpful. There are two great webinars uh, on Connecting to Collections website. They are a little bit on the American side, but they are very good. One is called Much Ado About Mannequins and it's from 2016. I love that name. Yeah. And one is Mounting Garments from 2013. And I'm going to pop links to them in the show notes. They are very good webinars with resource handouts and everything, which it's basically like a crash course in how to mount garments it's great so if you can't afford to go on fancy things then the internet is your friend (laughs) i really like lara flecker's book and we have an interview with her uh, later on in the episode but her book is extremely hands-on practical and it's it has all of the the practical best practice basically so you can read through that and see what you can achieve yourself and also what you're trying to work, work towards in with, with 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 whichever sort of budget situation you're working with a budget and time situation for other resources if you have been given for example a grant for the display of something proportion london is a mannequin maker that are museum grade conservation oh, nice. grade and they can be adapt they come in loads of different sizes shapes male female children trousers not trousers all of those um as all and side side pole adapted as well so you can fit trousers in there oh, or loads nice, of different yeah. types and they can be taken apart as well and kind of hack sorted about if you need to do that and padded up or padded or pad, pad, not necessarily padded down get slightly smaller one than you think you need mm. um 
They're really good. And then, of course, I'm not sure about the suppliers of Foss Shape, actually, but I imagine if you just Googled Foss Shape. Does Pell yeah, sell Pell, Pell, do Pell they? Care, is it? Yeah. Uh, so that's probably your source for it in the UK, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Oh, and also I found a very nice blog entry on Atlas Obscura, which was all about how they're uh, mounting costume and stuff at a museum. And I'll pop a link to that as well in the show notes. Uh, that's also worth a little read. Um, the most useful thing I found was a thing about making padded hangers, of which I made dozens while I was oh, in my previous God, yeah. museum. So many. Uh, but not exactly mounting. Storage is another tall kettle of fish, isn't it? But yeah. padded hangers yeah. are a really nice, mm. really nice way of obviously storing. And if you really have no other choice you can make padded hangers can't you mm. my museum actually last in the, the last exhibition to display um, political t-shirts my colleague made padded board t-shirt shapes inserts oh. that were attached to the walls with um uh, with magnets um invisible magnets for them to to sit on rather than going for the, oh, the coat cool. hanger that's effect cool so it t-shirt. looked like it was it looked like there was a form inside it but it wasn't human shaped form it was yeah. kind of t-shirt yeah, shape yeah. form which was really nice because you know most of these kind of blocky t-shirts are the same s- s- shape and size yeah, so it yeah, had sure. this really uniform kind of look um which worked really really well that's very cool and before we go i would just really like to give a shout out to another podcast that you can have a go at listening to it's called unravel and it's a fashion podcast uh, what makes it special is that one of its hosts is in fact a textile conservator and her name is dana gooden and uh, basically, I really recommend the show. It's a really great listen. And uh, we'll link to a couple of their episodes, which might be of special interest to conservators and, you know, museum boffins out there. I, I recommend the show in general, but definitely go and listen to these. Anyway, those will go in the show notes. Right. Well, in that case, I think we shall listen to an interview uh, by you, Chloe. Shan't we? Let's. I'm sitting here in the V&A Textiles Conservation and Costume Mounting Studio with the brilliant Lara Flecker, who has kindly agreed to speak to me today. To start us off, Lara, could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to be where you are? Hello. Um, As with all these things, my career kind of developed as opposed to me sitting down at an early age and thinking, this is exactly what I want to do. But I did actually have a bit of an epiphany moment um, because I was doing a, a foundation art course And I went to see a play and I was about to go off and do some kind of textile design degree. And I went to see this play and suddenly realised that there was a world of costume making out there and realised that that was something that I definitely wanted to learn how to do. So I did go off and train as a a costume, a theatre costume maker at Wimbledon School of Art um, and and did work in that industry for a few years. but before that, I'd even started that. I had, I was interested in the museum world um, and had even looked at conservation as a possible career, mm. but had kind of hung back from it um, a little bit. And that's fundamentally because I'm a very practical making kind of person and conservation for me, textile conservation for me did not completely fit. I didn't fit completely into that. My skills didn't. So I went to Hampton Court to do some um, volunteer work. uh, And at the time they were doing a lot of um, mounting at Kensington Palace. Um, So, and I ended up actually getting a job and um, doing a lot of costume mounting them. And from there, the job at the V&A came. um, And I'm extremely glad that I, I just happened to see it because I, I didn't know about it. Um, so how do you feel that being at the VNA has impacted your career? Well, um, I think fundamentally when I first arrived at the VNA, my job title was seamstress and there, oh, right. there wasn't a, there wasn't a great deal going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there was stuff going on, but no, not in the way it is now. And, um, as I started, the exhibition program started to develop and basically that has just taken on a life of its own and every year there is now more and more and more exhibitions mm-hmm. um, and displays and um, we're now kind of, I mean, there was me to start off with. There are now four permanent members oh, of great. the costume mm-hmm. mounting team um, as well as contractors. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can see that the whole job has, has changed enormously. Mm. So I think my role as a costume mounter has had to kind of respond to the sudden kind of demand for more mm-hmm. costume exhibitions mm-hmm. in the V&A. So those two things have kind of developed together. Mm-hmm. 
were they led by each other or was there was there one particularly led by it was led by i think the the demand for mm -hmm. fashion mm -hmm. in museums right um i think that's what's kind of driven it okay Okay. So compared with other museums, this department has a wealth of time and resources, but you're also constantly challenged to display things differently. And as you've said, the, the exhibition timetable has just snowballed. What do you see as the main driving forces of innovation in costume mounting? Um, I think probably public expectations yeah. is, 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 but then in a way that's the curators and designers interpretation mm -hmm. but there right. is definitely there, there's definitely a feeling the whole time that you mustn't stay still you must there's oh, right. you're always building on the project before all the mm -hmm. pro, you know so it's almost like you're a you know you you you, you can't just repeat the same thing mm -hmm. over and again you're always looking for something new and exciting mm -hmm. um the, I mean, the other thing that always is a is a huge factor in in these problems is budgets and money. I right. mean, there's, you know, you could do amazing and mm -hmm. wonderful and glorious things, mm -hmm. um, but the budget is what is res restricts that and um, kind of allows. Sometimes there's a, a bigger budget, which means that you do more. And I would always try and take advantage yeah. of the projects with the money to right, try and yeah. push the bounds a little mm -hmm. bit more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the I think also. And actually, this goes back to um, sort of my career at the V&A. Something that's changed over the years is the relationship that we in technical conservation have with our curators um, and um, how we kind of work together in, in a very collaborative way now. Um, and I think that process kind of definitely feeds into the, the innovation within exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose... Um, the other thing um, that I ought to mention um, is that at the V&A travel, most of our exhibitions um, around the world, um, and this has a, a big impact on the way we mount things. They have to be very robustly mounted because we travel mm -hmm. our costumes dressed on their mannequins where we can, oh, right, of course. Um, because this limits uh, the amount of handling mm -hmm. um, and also makes them kind of more affordable to museums because there's mm -hmm. much less time in putting them up and taking right. them down um so the way we mount things is is often influenced by whether they're traveling or not mm -hmm. and some of the the techniques that we've developed um are are tied up with with the fact that they are going to travel around and they need to be very secure um and then we also have created a whole system of how we pack these things mm -hmm. so once they're mounted they there are um, the way we create things and the way we soft pack them have all been, we've developed systems for doing all of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the V&A is quite unusual in that. I think pe other institutions are beginning to do this more, but, right. but um, we, we, we have done this for quite a long time mm -hmm. now, um, quite fairly successful. Um, so it's another big influence in, in the way we do things. So alongside all of that with public expectation and... Uh, I imagine also funding bodies pushing pushing for more and more um, exceptional exhibitions and more and more innovation again. Um, have you seen any significant developments in the field and in materials that have really changed attitudes to costume mounting for you and for others overseas as well? Um, I think the, probably the material that has had an impact on us uh, uh, the biggest impact on us in most recent times is foss shape. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love um, foss shape. <laughs> and we, I mean, we do love foss shape. Although, I mean, it is. I mean, every you know, I'm sure everybody's in a foss shape now, and, and how much you can do it, mm -hmm. and how I mean, for us, it's just wonderful because you can sew into it as yeah. well as make it solid. I mean, it, mm -hmm. the, the number of things you can do with mm -hmm. it is infinite. But actually, we've also found that when you when you introduce a new material like that suddenly you can do more things mm -hmm. and so then suddenly the expectations is yeah. that you will do uh, more things yeah. and so again you that's you know this is another issue that we have that you're constantly kind of you know pushing the boundary to see what more can you do mm -hmm. with this material and mm -hmm. if you do that then you know maybe you could do this yeah. and um it usually means an awful lot of our time developing things yeah. um and an example probably where we I, I would say the project where we've used foss shape most mm -hmm. um was in an exhibition called um revolutions where we made we ended up making foss shape limbs 
mm-hmm. and then attaching photographed um, sort of hands and feet and legs to the bottom. So oh, right. it was basically we made a three dimensional mm-hmm. limb in the that, that was sort of going to do what the the flat hand or foot or leg carried on mm-hmm. doing. It was quite a strange trippy exhibition. Mm-hmm. It was quite a strange mm-hmm. trippy effect. Yeah. Um, but it was it was quite interesting mm-hmm. pushing ourselves to see how much we could do mm-hmm. with for shape and we were basically cutting making these arms and then cutting them and taking darts out of them to make them into different shapes and poses mm-hmm. basically. Um, so it was an interesting it was an interesting mm-hmm. project. So yeah, for shape. <laughs> brilliant and are you allowed the time to do those to make those developments to do that work because it sounds time consuming it is time consuming and i would say you know you can we can only do it within the realms of each exhibition Mm -hmm. yeah so if for example in that instance um the designers came up with an idea right and you know, within a very short time, I needed to see whether that was possible. So within I that see, project, yeah. I could never sort of sit down and say, I think we should experiment with this <laughs> material and see what we can yeah. do. It's always project driven. Uh-huh. Um, but there's huge scope within mm-hmm. that because we do an awful lot of different yeah. exhibitions. And I think it's hard to make sure that we make, make the most of those opportunities. Mm-hmm. So lastly, now there aren't very many books um, on the subject of costume mounting and I think it'd be fair to say that yours is the core in the field. Um, What led you to producing it? Well very simply that at the time there was there wasn't really very much available Mm -hmm. and you know lots of smaller museums um, and institutions are expecting their staff to mount things with very little training or Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's the other thing is lacking very, very little training available at the time. Um, and it just seemed the right moment to try and get a book out there that could help mm-hmm. people who, you know, I used to get phone calls from people saying, oh, I don't know where to start. Yeah. And so the idea of the book is just that it's really practical and mm-hmm. you can kind of look up what it is you need to do, you need to sort of mount and, and, it, and that there are some sort of sensible advice that you could, if you followed the instructions, you could produce mm-hmm. something that is supportive and the right shape yeah and, um that kind of thing i mean i i think there's more stuff coming out and janet wood is is doing the book okay um there's okay. never enough of this kind of stuff and also you know i mean we could we could probably now do a new book where there's you know that would include things like fosh there's all mm-hmm. sorts of things that we probably you know new things that would do now mm-hmm. um, but fundamentally they're you know the, the basics in there that we still um so what would your advice be to, to smaller museums that have no access to training or resources and they're, they, they're, they find themselves in a situation where they have two items? Well, I think not to panic. Right. <laughs> Good um, first step. And, you know, that you can make an in... It is worth taking the time and effort. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can make a huge difference to the way something is... is it looks and, mm-hmm. and how safe it is on display mm-hmm. just by apl- applying a few of these the techniques that are put in the book and mm-hmm. they're not they're really there there should be all the information that you need in that book to carry them out so it will explain at the back how to you know how to gather up net if you need to mm-hmm. gather up net or so they you know you don't need to go somewhere else to to find out how to do something in order to do something in the book it's, it should be all very basic it's kind of common sense and it is working. It mm-hmm. really is doing. Even the tiniest bit of padding can make a huge difference mm-hmm. to to a garment and to its be when yeah. it's on display. Great. Well, Laura, thank you very much for speaking to the C word. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Dear Jane, I'm a recent graduate in the UK on a second career as a conservator and have been asked to quote a daily rate for a short-term freelance job with no managerial responsibility. I can't find any suggested rates for this kind of position, daily or hourly. Any advice? Many thanks. Dear many thanks, many thanks for your inquiry about what to charge as a conservator. You have told me that you're in the UK, but you have rather left me guessing as to what kind of work it is or where you might be based. So I'm kind of going to guess that it's not particularly specialist and that it's not um, based in the capital cities of London or Edinburgh, as I think you need to ask a little bit more. 
So how to answer the question? Well, we could start by saying what we think that we're worth, or we could look at comparators. I decided to follow the advice that I give everybody when they ask me about daily weights and look up what is a plumber charge. Now, what a plumber charge is very much does depend on where you live. But in the UK, you're talking £40 an hour, something like that, perhaps up to 60 So that's the first benchmark. What is a plumber charge? As a bonus, I looked up electricians as well, who are, seem to be slightly cheaper, but in the same range, 30 to 40 And I looked up a few other tradespeople as well. Mechanics in a garage seem to be charging £50 an hour for servicing, but I think that the staff are not getting that £50, so I'm not sure how seriously to take that. So those are our competitors, people with skills, but probably not many qualifications and certainly not as many as us, but people who've got lives to lead and families to feed in the same way that we do. And I looked then at what I suspected would be the bottom figure, and I looked at what an archaeologist gets paid. And according to some data on a website that I found about hourly rates, it was a shocking £15 an hour. £15 an hour seems to me really quite, a, I don't know, depressing amount of money to be charging on a daily basis for a qualified postgraduate or graduate trained profession. And to my mind, it's really, it's, I know it's nobody's fault that they're in this situation, but as a profession as a whole, when you start charging that little, there is always going to be a danger that your input isn't valued. So I think that we're going to pitch ourselves somewhere between the plumber and the archaeologist. The other way to look at it is look on the conservation register. If you go there, the the icon conservation register, you can see what people are charging um, around the UK. There are quite a few people show their hourly rate. And this might be a lot more helpful to you because you can see where people are based and you can make a more direct comparison to the kinds of activities that you're being asked to do. I've spent spent a few hours now looking at um, hourly rates. And I noticed anything from about 20 to about sort of £50 an hour. I think hovering mostly around the 30 to, to, to £40 an hour. But again, there's quite a lot of variety on there, you'd be surprised. So this is where I'm going to pitch up. I'm going to come and recommend that you ask for £35 an hour. Now this may seem a lot for a recent graduate, but I'm guessing if you're bidding on an hourly paid, then you'll be sorting out your own national insurance, you'll have to have your own indemnity insurance, You'll be covering your own sick pay, your own annual leave costs. And these things really add up as well as your own transport, any tools and equipment. Once you start looking at things like the indemnity insurance that you have to buy as a private practitioner, you really do need to start to budget for all these things. So I don't know how desperate you are, but if you ask for £35 an hour and they really want you but they can't afford that, then they might ask again and you could go down. If you ask for £20 an hour, they're never going to say, well, hey, we think you're worth 35 why don't you ask for more? So ask high, hold your breath, and that's the only advice I can realistically give you. I really hope it works out for you. Um, we'd love to hear, anonymously or otherwise, what rate you do end up charging. Over and out. Today I'm reviewing The Care and Display of Historic Clothing by Karen M. Depore. It's written and presented in the manner of a textbook for multiple levels of experience and expertise with costume collections. So as such, it doesn't go into detail about specific conservation methods. My initial impression of it is it's the type of book with an if there's any doubt, consult a conservator section to it. We literally can't know everything, so we've probably all felt that slightly guilty feeling of disappointment when we find out that a book isn't just going to tell us what we need to do. I have been honestly surprised by the breadth that's covered in this book, though. Not just storage or display, not just weave structures. So let's get into it. Chapter one, a timeline of fashion and history. I love a timeline. So I was both pleased and surprised to find this section. It covers events and innovations in costume broadly and provides a context for costume collections. I do bear in mind, though, that it's a world events view written by an American author. I think, for an American audience. So there's only so far it can be expected to cater for local social history collections in the UK, for example. Chapter 2 is called Historic Costume Basics. It starts from the beginning of the process, accepting acquisitions, numbering, packing and storage. And it does start at the basics, assuming an unfamiliarity with the museum process. While to many of us listening, listening, this isn't necessary, but the nature of this book would make it a valuable resource for new students, apprentices and volunteers, particularly the volunteer teams or volunteer-run museums without a conservator or without a museum-trained professional. The next chapter is about dating costume through style, and it gets more curatorial. 
I'm a complete sucker for this sort of thing. Diagrams and a table of features by date. It's worth noting again that this book focuses primarily on American and European fashion and history. Following this curatorial view of assessment, we dive into the conservation again with fibre identification. This was another surprise, and I wonder how and I wondered how accessible it would be to different readers. The answer to this is quite. It describes in detail how to perform a burn test, which though I recognise it as a valid method, I'm personally dubious of. It then goes through the process of microscopy with descriptions of what to look for and with nice big pictures of examples. In this section, I would have liked a bit more about textile qualities and what to look out for with sight and touch. As you'd expect, the chapter Preparing for Display describes more of some conservation techniques. Personally, I wouldn't advise some of the things that are suggested here for non-conservators, but it is expected in a volume that's targeted at so many people. It is, it's written and described really well, however, with an appropriate amount of caution thrown in. The, the dressing for display chapter is comprehensive and, again, broad, with tips for lower budgets as well as higher. As I've said previously in the episode, I've trained at the V&A briefly in costume mounting, but I'm still very new to it as a discipline. I'm delighted at the detail given, including measuring guidelines and cheats like using tights as a stretchy covering during the process. Though there are photographs in this section, I could still do with some diagrams along some of the descriptions. After this, we get curatorial again, with the reading costume section, with an in-depth description of how to look at clothing and collections to learn more of their history. Exhibiting costume goes even deeper into the curatorial waters, with the psychology of clothing in exhibitions and the case studies of different uses and achievements in exhibition storytelling. At the end of this chapter, we jump back to conservation, with managing environmental conditions, lux and RH briefly, and also pests and pollutants. Although the descriptions are clear and effective, these are deep and complex scientific topics, and it's a bit of a shame they're addressed so briefly. I have to remind myself, though, that the target audience is very, very broad. The target audience is clear in the final two chapters on interpretation, outreach and engagement, which are both instructive and imaginative. In fact, in fact, a comprehensive section on exhibition label writing is something that I can see myself using gratefully when responsible for conservation outreach. Such a huge range of topics are covered here that I'm encouraged to stop thinking about who the audience might be, the perfect pers- person to benefit from everything, but actually to consider that this book aims to achieve the instruction of a process and aims to provide all the information required for that process, regardless of the target audience. In this context, I can see the book as a way to inspire and instruct curatorial and collections management professionals in the best practice use and storage of their costume. And it provides much of the information to do that on every step of the way. In most institutions, particularly those with conservation staff, it's unlikely that every section of this would be relevant to a single person. But in situations of one person being solely responsible for the exhibition of a collection, this book would be invaluable. It could also function as a learning tool and a quick reference text for a non-specialist, or an aid memoir for specific bits of information. Generally, it's been enjoyable to review, particularly the silhouette diagram timeline. This is available on Amazon, and for the purposes of a UK audience buying it, it's only twenty three ninety five. so very affordable if you think this might be up your street. So the other day I was lucky enough to go to the Frida Kahlo exhibition Making Herself Up at the V&A in London. Full disclosure, I'm a huge and lifelong fan of Frida Kahlo. I was taught about surrealism, communism, and how to paint with her work from a young age. And when my marvellous unibrow was teased at school, I would look to her work for inspiration, rather than Britney Spears or whoever else it was in the 90s. And when I found out her belongings had been discovered, I cried. So it's safe to say I was always going to love this exhibition. And I thank Rachel both for entry in September and for speaking to me last year about her preparations for the mounting of the costume. You were both fascinating to talk with and patience with my over-enthusiasm. This can't be a fair review, but here are my thoughts. Firstly, I wanted to do a walk round audio tour of you, but it was far too busy. The start is a bit of a bottleneck with her early life, family and early story. The famous photographs begin here. A few of the early paintings, drawings and a lot of text. The depth of the story they've been able to tell here really makes you realise how amazing the collection is, how iconic the objects are. I know the photography and art really well, but I'm not really familiar with the film archive. And this was the first thing that really brought her to life for me. The video of her and her husband Diego Riviera working on a mural together. I was happy to see how much of her culture and inspiration they've included, 
and I was pleasantly surprised how much of her politics also made it in. Nicola Sullivan's review criticised it for having too little of this in the museum's journal, but I was worried that they'd ignore it completely, so I was pretty happy. The first of her personal effects took me by surprise for some reason. Her crescent-shaped earrings, but that was nothing compared to the next room. The first of the two high-impact rooms. There are six display cases in this room, in front of a huge photo of Frida Kahlo in recovery following an operation. The cases are shaped like her birds and house her most personal possessions. The effect is breathtaking and extremely intimate, but it's also extremely heartbreaking. Along with amazing objects like her lipstick is the book of poetry that was next to her when she died. Around the room are letters from doctors, references to surgeries and then painkillers and medications, and next to her cast corsets and prosthetics. She was in a lot of pain through most of her life, but she never stopped painting until her death. I was pretty emotional, I have to say, but I still noticed the extraordinarily lovely object mounting. Very subtle, sensitive and safe for the object. Perfectly bespoke, perspex stands, with all of the budget and all of the time. Just stunning. When I managed to drag myself away from this room, I went into the final room, and the second of the high-impact rooms. The majority of the costume is in this room, all in one giant case on a literally monumental plinth. It's astonishing and extremely well-judged. Many of the self-portraits are around this room, as well as photography, gifts, jewellery, and so on. This time telling the story of Frida Kahlo as the style icon. I'm glad they kept this separate from her life story and illness. It would be easy for the fashion to overshadow the tragedy in an exhibition like this. So what can I criticise? I'm sure there are plenty of ways the story could have been told, or for the objects to be displayed, so I don't see the point in criticising exhibitions in these terms. I can say that the extremely high expectations that we have for the quality of the V&A blockbuster exhibitions were completely met, and I love to see what can be achieved by museums when budgets aren't limited. But what I will say is that I spent nearly £100 getting to London from Manchester, and I only managed to see the exhibition at all because I was let in by a member of conservation. There was very little in the way of advertisement outside the museum, and the tickets were completely sold out until the show ends in November. No tickets left at all. You can't get in. And the only way to see the exhibition is if you were already a fan, already in touch with the museum world, keen enough to book in advance at least two months before the end date, and able to afford travel into London. Probably on a weekday, let's face it, as well. V&A, I'm afraid you lose points for accessibility, and I hope some work has been done to monitor audience diversity. Maybe I'm in too deep with the museum for which this is a priority, but I do think opportunities for outreach and education must have been missed by simply not having walk-in tickets. It's a fabulous exhibition, though, and the first time that her objects and personal effects have been out of Mexico. Conservation, of course, gets top marks, as if I needed to say that. And thank you again for access. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. And this time, we'd like to welcome our latest patrons, Eliza and Ava. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Thanks for listening with C Word, and you've been listening to Christina Rosaic, Chloe Ramsey, and me, Jen Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about military collections. In the meantime, check out our website at thecword.show, tweet us at the C Word Podcast, or simply email us on thecwordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by DD Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production.
Okay, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you ever need like chuckling, background <laughs> chuckling noises, you've got so many samples. So many options. 